Hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I really um, want to say welcome again to the second uh, part two of our teach-in, our Zoom teach-in on George Floyd um, and the murder of George Floyd. Uh, today, we're going to be um, talking about issues of police and policing reform um, with, uh, with two guests. And we're really looking forward to that, um, to this conversation that we're going to be having for the next hour and a half. I also need to note that we are providing um, ASL services for, for this forum. Um, and if there are any um, deaf participants, however, that have questions or technical issues that might arise as we're having this conversation, if you could uh, put those questions in the chat uh, and so that we may get those resolved in real time. Well, like last week, what I'd like to do is open up this conversation um, with a moment of silence or moments of silence in honor of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McKay, Armad, Armad Arbery, Sandra Bland, Charlena Lyles, and so many who have gone from us, have been taken from us. So I'd like to hold again a moment of silence of eight minutes and 46 seconds.
Thank you all. Um, so once again, what we're going to be doing here today is, is talking um, talking about uh, the George Floyd uh, murder, uh, and more specifically, looking at issues of policing and police reform. We're going to discuss officer-involved killings, amongst other things, and and the police responses to demonstrators and demonstrations across the nation, and what could be done in the way of policing reform. Um, I'm really honored and privileged and um, to have as our guests um, Shakira Diaz and Lisa Degard, um, who are going to be leading the conversation. Um, I will do introductions of them in a moment, and then we'll take it away with questions and answers. But I just wanted to sort of provide some, if I could, some historical context about what we're talking about. Uh, when we talk about race and racism and policing. And I, I think it's, it's really critical to put this into historical context. Uh, and that is this notion that the policing of black bodies um, by the state is nothing new. Um, this has been going on for over 400 years in our country. First with the slave codes, as we know, um, that control the movement and ambulation and mo of, of slaves and slavery. So we have over 400 year history of this. Um, we also see during that time, the creation of laws and ordinances that sought to control the movement of, of blacks through like curfews and loitering laws. 
Now, movement and congregation restrictions were also rampant during that time, um, where there were direct initiatives made to address uh, the fears of the colonists of conspiratorial actions by slaves. Like, for example, there were statutes that restricted the activities and movements of slaves um, that became widespread, for example, in New York uh, in the 1700s, 1600s, I'm sorry. Slaves could not congregate in groups of more than three, right? Laws were legion. In Massachusetts, for example, a, a law stated that if one or more slaves shall in the time of alarm or evasion be found at the distance of one mile or more from the habitation or plantation of their respective owners, it shall be a judged felony without benefit of clergy and such slave or slaves. And it shall be lawful, it may be lawful for the person or persons finding such slave or slaves to shoot or otherwise destroy such slave or slaves without being impeached, censured, or prosecuted for the same. So we had these laws, we had slave pat patrols, we had anti-congregation laws. Um, another example was in 1755, Virginia governor ordered slave quarters inspected every night. In Georgia, a generation before the American Revolution, laws were passed in 1755 and 1757 requiring plantation owners or their white employees to make monthly inspections of slave quarters. In Boston, for example, slaves could not leave their owner's home after 9 p.m. And if they were found to have violated the policy, they could be whipped. Now, it was easy to see uh, a continuation of those laws, those slave codes and slave patrols as they went through um, um, Jim Crow um, post-emancipation and through the black codes. We saw that um, where vagrancy and loitering was once again criminalized or continued to be criminalized. And it was easy to draw a direct line from those laws to some of our present day laws that uh, go to loitering and congregation. During the Ferguson demonstrations, for example, the police tried to institute or enforce a keep moving policy, which basically said that people could not stand still if they were demonstrating for more than five seconds. And, and also that law had an anti-congregation element of having of five or more persons being limited to five or more persons. But, the thought, but there was instituted this five second rule, the idea that the police could arrest you demonstrating if you stood still for more than five seconds. So it is not hard at all. It should not be hard to imagine how that rule and how that law is a direct, perverse, wicked descendant of slave movements and slave laws which, which sought to keep slaves moving from standing still, from resting. So there's easy to draw these conclusions. Now we see it in, um, we see it in modern day with another form of policing black bodies that also revolts out in death, right? We see the hypermilitarization of the police in controlling black bodies as they make claims in in trying to demonstrate for their rights and for racial justice and economic justice and social justice. We see now the police able to use chemical weapons upon black bodies and brown bodies as they seek to pursue not only their First Amendment rights of assembly and petition, but to seek redress um, through an unjust criminal system and, uh, and the institution of, of, of of justice and crime. Um, it recalls for me when we see the brutality that attended, that attends these demonstrations and the physical abuses that are visited upon those seeking their rights. Um, and the shock that some of us, particularly white people, are experiencing a shock so profound that they are joining in unison. Um, and they too are amazed and shocked at the brutality that police have visited upon black bodies. And finally, if you will, finally, um, seeing for themselves what black folks knew all along, 
And I'm gonna close this opening by quoting James Baldwin. I ended last session with James Baldwin. So I'm gonna start with a quote from James Baldwin, who basically said um, a similar thing as it re regarded the Holocaust. It's like white people were and are astounded by the Holocaust in Germany. They did not know that they could act that way, but I very much doubt whether black people were astounded, at least in the same way. For, the, for my part, the fate of the Jews and the world's indifference to it frightened me very much. I could not but feel in those sorrowful years, in those sorrowful years that this human indifference concerning which I knew so much already would be my portion on the day that the United States desired, decided to murder its Negroes systematically instead of the little by little and catch as catch can. And I was, of course, authoritatively assured that what had happened to the Jews in Germany could not happen in America, could not happen to Negroes in America. But I thought bleakly that the German Jews had probably believed similar counselors. And again, I would not share, I could not share white people's vision of themselves for the very good reason that white people in America do not behave toward black people the way they behave toward each other. When a white person faces a black person, especially if the black person is helpless, terrible things are revealed. I know I have been carried into the precinct basements often enough and I have seen and heard and endured the secrets of desperate white people, which they know were safe with me because even if I should speak, no one would believe me. And they would not believe me precisely because they know, they would know that what I said was true. We're gonna be joined now by um, two individuals who know well and are experts in looking at the issues of policing, who have been to those precincts and who have seen those precinct basements and who have counseled and spoken with people who are part of, uh, who have been swept up um, and brutalized by our system of injustice and policing. Um, I'm proud to what um, I'm proud to welcome Lisa Dogard and Shakira Diaz. So I was just going to do a little bit of their bios, if you will. Currently, Lisa is the executive director of the Public Defender Association in Seattle, Washington, and is a 2019 MacArthur Fellowship recipient. Lisa served as deputy director of the King County Department of Public Defense through August 2015 and previously supervised misdemeanor practice from 2002 and 2006, and then was deputy director of the PDA in 2007 until 2013 at the Defenders Association, I'm sorry, at the Defender Association, which is a nonprofit public defender's office in Seattle. Lisa was founding staff member at the Defender Association Racial Disparity Project and went on to direct the Racial Disparity Project from 2000 to the year 2012. She started as a felony and misdemeanor lawyer at the Defender Association. And in 1999, as a staff attorney, she coordinated the successful defense of hundreds of activists unlawfully arrested during the W2EO demonstrations. Prior to becoming a public defender in 1996, Lisa directed the Urban Justice Center Organizing Project, which is a leadership development program for emerging homeless and formerly homeless activists in New York City. And even before that, she was <coughs> leader of the Coalition for Homeless, also in New York City, uh, where she co-founded Street Watch, an early police watch program focused on police treatment of homeless people and sued a business improvement district for violating minimum wage laws for people paying for paying homeless workers a dollar an hour to do outreach to other homeless people. Now, after Lisa graduated from law school, she was a fellow at the ACLU National Legal Department, where she helped coordinate a successful campaign and litigation to shut down, but shut down the internment camp of HIV positive Haitian refugees at Guantanamo Bay. Naval Base. Lisa also served from 2013 to 2016 as co-chair of Seattle's Community Police Commission. And she continues to serve as a commissioner. She graduated from the University of Washington and obtained an MA in government from the 
Cornell University, and a JD from Yale Law School. Welcome, Lisa. Shakira, Shakira Diaz is Managing Director of Partnerships of the, uh, an Ohio State Director for the Alliance for Safety and Justice in Cleveland, Ohio. Shakira is a strategist with extensive public policy and organizing experience grounded in authentic coalition building and other skills and needs. Shakira joined ASJ in 2016 as the regional director for the Midwest region, where she provided leadership for advocacy programs in the Midwest, resulting in criminal justice reforms and the establishment of trauma recovery centers to help underserved crime survivors heal. Prior to joining ASJ, Shakira worked as an educator and led policy reform campaigns. Now, in these different capacities, Shakira enhanced educational outcomes for students and led successful policy, legislative, and judicial rules campaigns to improve the justice systems. Her efforts have led to the elimination of unfair drug law policies, enhanced protections for sexual assault victims during interviews, expanded access to counsel, supported voting rights access for currently and formerly incarcerated people, and ended routine juvenile shackling in courts. A drawing on her personal experience with sexual and community violence and her understanding of various institutions and systems, Shakira helped shape systematic, systemic recommendations for reform efforts, including the Cleveland Division of Police's consent decree. Shakira is a graduate of Case Western Reserve University and lives in Cleveland, Ohio with her family. Welcome, Shakira. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you both for being here. And I want to start and open up with um, just a general question. Um, Lisa, first, um, could you give us your reactions to what we have seen in Seattle, Minneapolis, all over the nation of the re good responses, but also some of the horrific instances of police brutality, criminality, and misconduct? Sure, um, just a couple of observations. Can you hear me first of all? I had to sort of engineer this to yes. call in twice. Okay, good. Um, my my uh, laptop connection's not so great. So, well, I am um, just struck by how reminiscent this is of past instances of ma um, police responses to mass uprisings, somehow managing to um, miss <laughs> either miss an opportunity or uh, just confirm essential truths about policing in America. Um, obviously what's happening in the streets is, um, you know, hopefully ushering in and making possible fundamental um, reimagination of how we deliver public safety and order in this country, I could not be more, um, you know, hopeful and excited. Um, it was an interesting um, opportunity for law enforcement to um, demonstrate, you know, at the beginning, at the outset of the Trump administration, there was this brief moment where I actually thought I was seeing what, occur what sometimes occurs in other countries, which is municipal police forces um, siding with their own people against abuse sort of at the um, national level um, invoking the military um, because there had been you know so much great work around um, uh, not you know sort of don't ask don't tell non-cooperation of local police forces with ICE with um, immigration removal and um, because of the immediate sort of saber rattling of the Trump administration, there was this sense that municipal police forces might just pick, you know, pick their own people uh, over that. And I think this was another moment where that could have happened. And in a few places, it kind of happened. Um, the, those places where, you know, some police leaders and some rank and file folks chose to assume postures of submission, humility, walk with people in the street, be on their side in a, in a physical way. In general, that isn't what has happened and really, um, 
you know, remarkably, that is not what happened here in Seattle. So it reminds me of 2014 and 20 in, in Seattle in 2015 and the first round of Black Lives Matter street demonstrations. In, here in Seattle, there was not, um, you know, there were there were a lot of um, a lot of folks in the streets, a lot of new leaders um, engaging in unpermitted but peaceful marches. And uh, uh, when they started, the focus was really not local. It was really not about, um, you know, specific recent problematic encounters that folks had with the police. Not not that those didn't exist, but that was really not the the immediate focus. But after the first night of police response. It was because the Seattle Police Department just like stepped right into the role and um, came out in hardened gear, acted like those folks, those young people. I and mean, they were like high school kids who had not done politics before. They went out into the street. They would have probably have been open to the concept that their local police department was, you know, <laughs> like on their side. Um, but that's not what they saw. They saw people treating them like enemies and them like and um, here we are you know five years later just doing another episode of that so I think it's just a lot of police forces co-signing the narrative strangely choosing to co-sign the narrative about um, the essential quality um, of policing in America and, and you know maybe that's maybe that's not unhelpful maybe it will help to eliminate some confusion about the um, degree of transformation that's required. Thank you. Um, Shakira, your, your thoughts and reactions. Well, first, I wanted to respond to your Baldwin quote um, and start there. And so um, Hitler in Mein Kampf actually praises the United States for developing this racial hierarchy based on naturalization that allows for the exclusion of citizenship for anybody beyond white. Mm. Um, so where Hitler got his cues was the United States. Um, so let me start there. Uh, <laughs> and and, and it's, it's important to make that distinction. It's important to understand that we often in this country point in every other direction when really the finger's pointing and should be pointed at us and how other countries model the US. Right? Um, so I wanna make sure that we're grounded in that first. Um, but you know, it, this is just what we're seeing today. And I am from Cleveland, you know, it's interesting, Cleveland has a very strong history. There was uprisings in Cleveland um, in the 60s. Um, Cleveland was like the, the Northern home base for Martin Luther King. Um, Cleveland was home to the first black mayor in the country. Uh, but Cleveland is also home to, you know, the shooting and death of Brandon McLeod, a 14 year old boy in the closet of his home, uh, there, which was later followed up with um, two people who were shot in a, in, a, in a chase, the highest number of bullets shot by police at two people in history, later followed by the slamming death of Tanisha Anderson, now, Tanisha Anderson is happening at a time when Ferguson is going on, at a time when it's already been decided that Cleveland's gonna be home to the Republican National Convention, and then shortly after, Tamir Rice is killed. Yes. So what we have seen is not odd, you know, it's pretty consistent with the lack of accountability um, with regard to violence against black people. And the fact, and it reflects a systemic disregard for the humanity of Black people. You know, from the very beginning of, of, of how this country has viewed how it should relate to Black people it has always been within this context of control. So it's very consistent. You know, um, I think this country has, has really mastered a way of um, remixing these strategies that have always been very effective. But again, it's, it's still very grounded in this. One, the, the failure to acknowledge the humanity of Black people, coupled with the lack of accountability towards the violence that's enacted against Black people. Thank you for that. 
And, and then there are two things I want to amplify um, um, in listening to both of your um, responses. First, with regards to Shakira, um, and, and, and looking at particularly and especially recounting the, the ugly history that Cleveland has had um, in, in the murders of Tanisha Anderson, um, the, um, the, the two, two individuals who were shot. How many bullets was it? 160 something bullets? Um, 137. How many? 137. 37 bullets that went to the bodies and to that car, to Mayor Rice, of course. Um, but one thing, one term you both raise, and, and language is important here, when you talk about these demonstrations as uprisings. And I don't think, I think it's important not to, not to lose that um, because there are other ways in which these, what we're seeing today are framed as riots, as disruptions, as, um, as, as and, 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 and the use of those terms themselves um, denote and connote a type of narrative that they want associated with those people engaged in that, in that, in that thing, in those events. And so, I'll, um, I just want, I just want to honor and, and amplify what you were, how you're describing what we're seeing today. Um, Shakira, do you have anything you want to add to that that notion or description? It, I think that you know, people have taken it back to how we started this moment of silence, right? I never realized how long that was, right? Mm -hmm. And it, as we were in that moment, I thought about the several opportunities there was to stop. Yes, yes, yes. How, I mean, so there's that. And as I thought about that, I thought about having to watch um, the video of Tamir being shot and having to watch that over and over because it happened so fast, mm -hmm. I didn't see it. Mm -hmm. So the fact that people have responded the way that they have calling for this acknowledgement of humanity, whether you have a very long time to stop where you're, stop the harm that you're causing or to think twice before you take a life is what people are responding to. It's what, you know, seeing that and seeing the ugliness and the slowness of that moment is what people are responding to. Yeah, uh, Lisa. There's something, I think that at a, at a subliminal pre-conscious level, people understand what it would have to mean for um, the events that took place when George Floyd was killed to, to have unfolded. Um, and it's not the one incident alone. It's also everything that has to, that has to have gone before, everything that is implicit, everything that is assumed, everything that is um, right. relied upon um, that, that people are, are responding to and tapping into it is so obviously not just about what or for officers, but rather about um, the way that that power is structured and understood. Um, so I don't know. I mean, people are right is the thing. Like, right? These responses are are about whole um, generations of experiences that some that many people have had directly, and that other people are um, recognizing must be true like and um, obviously there's just so much accumulated um, truth but I also think if I can jump into what I know are coming questions I also think this is a little bit about the failure of the accountability experiment if you will um, there isn't a set of structures strategies you know, 
um, uh, configurations of accountability processes that hasn't been tried. <laughs> I just want to like, they're all out there and they all fail. And I think that that's part of what's also happening is that the, the um, easy answers are sort of already stripped of their capacity to soothe and um, reassure. No one could look you in the face and say, well, if you just give so-and-so subpoena power or if you just you know make it possible for as we did in washington you know make it legally possible for officers to be prosecuted then things would no i mean none of those things on their own um yield uh this is a debate i've been having with some colleagues um none of those things promise um to to significantly affect the way it plays out mm -hmm. And maybe we all had to live through trying them to learn that. But um, I think we have all learned that. We've learned we've learned the failure of different strategies. But if you look around the country, you cannot find um, answers within the current structure that are at all reassuring. So we have arrived at this moment where, um, you know light touch reassurance is completely unavailing right. and I love I love that everyone seems to be ready to have that conversation. Uh, Shakira would you like to continue that line of, 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 of consideration and discussion on this this sort of accountability process it's because you brought that up as well um, so let's right. continue but what's what what hasn't worked and why it hasn't it worked? So in Cleveland, um, when we were going through our process, you know, we, we studied Seattle um, and their community police commission, um, which outside looking in, it still worked out way better than it did in Cleveland. Um, I think one factor that, that's missing here is, is political will. Hmm. And... Um, the role that um, political influencers have in the process is huge when you're when you're going through this consent decree, right? Mm -hmm. The the horse trading that happens to ensure that the composition of the monitoring team is one that the mayor and the and the union feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. These are things that are not like out in generally out in the open. The selection process for those who sit on a community police commission. Um, and the process of selecting and excluding. All of these things are really about political will, right? Separate and apart from the accountability measures that could be set in place. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what we don't have um, is a way by which we can see the disciplinary actions against police officers, right? Mm -hmm. That it's not done in such a way that is transparent, easily accessible, and that you know any grandma in the country can look up, right? That doesn't exist. Neither does uh, a way by which uh, law enforcement or police officers who violate their oath are decertified. It happens in every other, in, in professions where people take oaths, people can be reprimanded and decertified. I've seen it happen to attorneys, I've seen it happen to doctors, but again, it's like, what is the purpose here, right? What is the mission of it? And you, you spoke about it when you talk about the history. Um, but you know, in these conversations, when we talk about these contracts and consent decrees, I think what often gets left out is the political will and the, and the many actors that are involved um, in, 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 in producing something um, that ends up being hundreds of hours, lots of money that amount to indifference. Yeah, and, and, and what are those, let's talk a little bit about those, um, those the compositions of those boards that, are, that, are, that happen or that exist in not only Seattle, but Cleveland. Um, and it's also my understanding that uh, Minnesota was at least initially seen as a model for Seattle. Um, Seattle's composition. I'm not sure if that's correct or not, but that's interesting. 
but what was, talk about the process um, of developing the oversight board and, and how effective were those boards um, or are those boards? Shakira has focused on some of um, the challenges to say the least with the composition of those boards, but I'd like us to take a little bit more time to talk about the structure of those boards, their supposed function and their efficacies. Um, and Maybe Lisa, Lisa can go first, yeah, because hmm. we look to we look to Seattle's as as a model. Now, you know, it was still pretty new, but it, mm -hmm. we saw it as a model. We, um, I, I look back really fondly on those um, phone calls, conspiratorial phone calls that the Seattle Community Police Commission had with our um, colleagues in counterparts in Cleveland, because it was very much like, okay, these are the struggles that we've had. Mm -hmm. There are um, very significant barriers, not necessarily the ones that you would predict. Um, you know, for us, a major barrier was um, what we came to call the um, police accountability industrial complex. Um, this uh, cadre of professional civilian oversight uh, folks who are overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly male, highly compensated, um, and not terribly responsive to um, the uh, sort of emerging um, dynamics and priorities of community. That was our experience. And so we were able to share that. Cleveland then turned around and wrote this incredible letter about its uh, the expectations of the um, community leaders uh, about selection of the monitor, as Shakira alluded to. So we tried, you know, we've tried to like share um, all around the country. We've all tried to share our experience of you know what what barriers do people hit, um, and we both hit them. So um, I'm going to run down really fast. Uh, my experience and lessons learned in the Seattle Police Commission, I, Community Police Commission, I continue to believe that this was a model that could have, like it held great promise. And mm -hmm. the promise was not defeated because of the model. It wasn't the wrong model. We were defeated by political opposition as well as like professional um, resistance from supposed allies. So but I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with the model. It was, um, I, I wanna name a, a, a crucial distinction between the word civilian and um, the word community. For a long time, folks have talked about civilian oversight, right? Mm -hmm. um, it turns out that there's nothing special about a civilian except that they're not a sworn officer. There's Just because you're a civilian does not mean you have any organic, deep, relationship of accountability to community experience to people who have been directly impacted adversely by policing or or failure to provide policing services both are ways in which police departments can fail marginalized communities um, and vulnerable people so we really centered um, the seattle community police commission was meant to um, privilege and center community-based expertise. So not in a tokenizing way of like, oh, you're directly impacted. Um, you don't really understand the system, but you have a, an experience. No, it was really about um, very uh, recognizing that um, people in communities most affected by failure of policing um, and who need to be satisfied with a new approach um, also possess really profound expertise and that that was what needed to be brought to bear in the conversation. When we, when we were building the Seattle, um, uh, sorry, I will say first, the Seattle CPC came out of community resistance, not only to the practices of the police department, but also to the highly professionalized recommendations that were flowing from the department of the Obama Justice Department, um, which was correct in its findings that there ha was a pattern of civil rights abuses, but in our view, and when I say our, I mean a 
broad-based, long-standing multiracial alliance of um, community leaders that had um, established a lot of mutual trust and had been working together, trying lots of different strategies to gain more leverage um, on police accountability for many years. So that consortium of people that was instrumental in bringing the Justice Department investigation to, into being was not um, impre not super impressed by the um, the answers that DOJ was recommending and proposed our own, and out of that came this model of um, an ongoing community panel or body that would continuously test the um, purported solutions against community experience and. Um, ensure that the um, the hoped for you know steps forward really worked and continuously identify failures and and propose corrections so it was like a com continuous improvement model and it was target it was focused on policy not on firing people um, and the and in order to account like that was because we wanted to make sure that people who were not neutrals, um, uh, people who were activists tapped into um, dissatisfaction and a very strong point of view were in the conversation. I think early on there was some confusion about that, um, both public officials and people in the police department were anxious about putting activists on this board because they were used to thinking of the civilian oversight role as like ju quasi judicial, that this mm -hmm. should be someone deciding whether to fire people. And so people having a point of view could um, impede the appearance of fairness or compromise due process goals there. We were like, hey, that's actually not even the role that we wanna play. We want to have the conversation bringing all the um, legitimate points of view about policing into the same room, holding space for tension, um, and, and basically remaining in dialogue until the reasons why people have such different points of view around policing get surfaced and we work through as best we can to arrive at a way forward that can meet all of the legitimate needs of these diverse communities. And you cannot do that with people who are neutral and you cannot do that with people who are overly professionalized. So um, that really did work well, I will say, but because um, it became a real thing, it started generating recommendations, points of view and answers that were not welcome. <laughs> um, basically, so, that would the though the powers that be expected that commission to be basically like the cheerleader squad for things they already wanted to do um and we were like no if, if that's what you wanted first of all you picked the wrong people but secondly that's superfluous like you don't need people to tell you what you're already doing is the right thing you need us to tell you what you're missing and there's never been a deep acceptance about the importance of tension in these structures, that you're supposed to be having these disagreements, you're supposed to be surfacing um, what hasn't been fixed yet. It is never necessary to have um, you know, um, a back padding, squealing <laughs> is not helpful. Um, and then I just also wanna name an uncomfortable truth here, which is that um, we ran into, you know, for people who are fantasizing about, you know, next year and a new administration and a return to pattern and practice consent decrees. Um, for us, the consent decree itself became an impediment to community power. Um, and we just have the wrong, like, I, I, I could overly, I could trace this to some very local circumstances, like exactly who the judge is, exactly who the monitor is, but I don't wanna get so specific. I wanna name that going back to the 70s and school desegregation, um, common ground and other work on, you know, kind of how community leaders lost control of that process, the more it got abstracted into the court and into monitors, is very, very difficult to retain a dynamism 
an organic relationship between community experience and a court driven um, reform process. So we are definitely, we, we are like the poster child for how that can go wrong. It did go wrong. That was not the Trump administration's fault. It had already gone wrong before the administration changed. Oh, this is one wonderful, wonderful thoughts and reflections. Um, thank you, Lisa. Uh, Shakira, could you give us your, your, your perspectives on those same subjects? So the first half of what Lisa said is why in Cleveland, we were so inspired by Seattle, right? Um, so what happened is that anybody who was involved in, in any form of community organizing, um, any community person who, who just wanted to see a change, um, anyone who was invested in, in the city um, and the well being of city residents um, attended these weekly um, meetings at, um, we call it in Cleveland, the People's Library, it was the MLK branch in Cleveland. And we had these huge meetings every week where we collectively agreed on what each group was going to, we came up with what each group was going to advocate for. And we did it in unison. So it didn't matter which group you talked to, you were always going to get the same response, um, which was amazing. It was, it was beautiful. Um, part, and so once we get to the point where we, there's going to be the establishment of a community police commission, they must have heard about what was going on in Seattle already because um, they developed a tiered system in Cleveland where there was a, a selection committee. Um, and in the selection committee, um, you know, there is, it was essentially like civic leaders, right? Um, you would have to submit an application. And then from that, they would identify people who would be interviewed to sit on the community police commission. Um, so I was one of those people who was, who was asked to apply. And at the end of this process, now mind you, I've been working in this, you know, for a while, I'm walked to the elevator and I'm handed a very blank, um, very broad background check form to fill out. And I asked, you know, what is this for? And it was a requirement that the response that I was given at the time was, well, you know, the mayor wants everyone to fill this out. And I said, why? What's the reason for that? We, we don't know. We just, the mayor wants everyone to fill this out. Uh, so I said, let me take it with me. And, you know, the city of Cleveland is one where the majority of people who are, um, uh, who, who live with criminal, with felony convictions are from the city of Cleveland for, um, 20 something years, the city of Cleveland had this policy in place that over criminalized the possession of, of drug paraphernalia and overcharged it as felony cocaine possession. Mm -hmm. The city of Cleveland was also very hard hit by the foreclosure crisis, by these things that have absolutely nothing to, like the people of Cleveland have no control over. So this very broad background check went into criminal background check, credit, I mean, it was everything, right? So, you know, by this point, it was already decided that I, I think our commission was going to have about 10 people. Three of those spots were going to be reserved for the heads of the, of the three unions in the city. Uh, and then the seven, the remaining seven would be for community leaders who apparently had to have A1 credit and zero felony <laughs> convictions. <laughs> Third. Mind you, people yeah. like regular Clevelanders who have criminal convictions, who have been disproportionately impacted by criminalization, targeted enforcement, bad lending practices are very, are deep people best positioned to sit on there, right? right? But the way to discourage people was like, it was that process, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm getting calls like, when are you going to submit your background check form? And from several of the selection committee members. And uh, what I asked for was, hmm, you know, I really don't believe in that. You know, I don't believe in, in collateral sanctions. I understand why 
the process by which people become criminalized. I understand the process by which people get bad loans. I understand all of that. And I understand why uh, Clevelanders, you know, which this it's a city that I grew up in, are impacted. And I said, you know what, let me, you know, I would consider filling it out if I can see the, um, the full uh, employment and complaint records on, on the three um, law enforcement representatives for the union. <laughs> and the response is like, oh my God, we can't do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you wanna know all my business and I wanna know all of theirs, right? So we can start fair, right? Can't do that. <laughs> um, so I decided not to participate, but it, it, it really, it's, to me, it was, we started out with so much hope. There was so much um, just passion and commitment every single Saturday. And that's not counting all the other follow-up meetings. Like, you know, I was constantly on the phone with like Lisa and, and Jennifer Shaw. Uh, like we were constantly in communication about how to do this and how to make it, um, how to do it in such a way that was authentically rooted in creating a safe city. But again, the political will was not there. So I think that's a factor that needs to be, you know, considered. I think in many ways, when when a consent decree is enacted, and or it signals a little sense of acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you have come from hundreds of years of being ignored and invalidated, that little that little piece of acknowledgement gives you some hope like finally someone sees what I'm, I'm going through but but again it goes back to political will and if it's not there it's not there um and if the commitment is more about good pr for a city a lot of hands are going to be in that to make sure that happens do you see i'm going to ask you for Shakira and then hand it off to lisa do you see in the current environment um, where, for example, in Seattle, you see representatives of those who are pushing for social and economic justice um, and, and, and reform, sitting down with city leaders, do you see optimism in spaces? And with that, I want each of you to talk about how the issues of police reform, how the issue of police reform is has been reframed in this era of defunding the police or reforming um, the police um, practices. Um, so in the course of talking about what you're seeing today in, uh, in terms of some of the structural corrections that need to be made, could you also help us, um, members of the audience, get their heads around what are they talking about when they talk about defunding the police? Well, you know, I know for, for different groups, it means different things, but some historical context here. You know, in the 70s, mental health hospitals were shut down. There was no building community health infrastructure. You know, that was later followed with, you know, drug addiction becoming an, an issue that was of national concern. We did not see the mass infrastructure building of drug treatment. So little by little, you're seeing like this defunding of important infrastructure, supporting social, um, social issues, right? They really served to prevent crime from happening in the first place. It was responsive around mental health and addiction needs. All those dollars then were shifted towards building prisons. So what people want to see is an invest, like infuse mental health, infuse drug treatment, infuse restorative justice programming, infuse uh, prevention, right? While also not doing the mass criminalization that has made life generationally difficult and almost unbearable for so many in this country. So it's really about like shifting priorities in such a way that we are shifting towards safety. 
because what we have been doing for many years has been about this false idea that more police equals more safety. That's not true. We know that's not true. More safety comes from stability, from support, from being responsive to needs. But we have not funded that as a country for the last 30, 40 years. We have been funding policing and the building of prisons and the building of, of jails. You know, in Ohio, we have the second highest overdose rate in the country. Second only to, uh, to uh, West Virginia. And we're one of the top incarcerating states in the country for both men and women. But that's where we have prioritized investment. It's like if you, because we have made these funding priorities, we are getting this return on investment, which is what we're seeing today. And people across every spectrum are touched by it. And people across every spectrum are upset about it, which is why, um, why I think this moment feels different. Um, it is very much about a, a collection of indifferences, particularly that Black people have felt, but white people have felt it too. Um, you know, Latinos, First Nation people, Asian people, people are feeling this, right? Which is why we're seeing, the, why we're seeing the level of diversity in, in, in the uprisings that have happened in every state in this country. You know, one thing that has made national news in Ohio that I find really interesting is that rural communities across the entire state that are almost exclusively white are having these, these marches. It's never happened before. Like communities that have like 3,000 people and like four of them are black are having these types of, of demonstrations. And it's speaking to this recognition. We're acknowledging our own humanity and demanding that the system does that as well, right? So shifting what we need to be able to see is one, in, in the form of accountability, we need to see the transparency, right? Um, and real accountability via decertification, we need to see investments in the things that make that ensure that we can all share in this in this idea of safety, which is those investments in mental health, drug addiction services, prevention, and and restorative justice, to name a few. Thank you for that. I'm going to ask Lisa to respond to that question, but also to transition us into a Q, the Q and A for the audience. So. Um, like you to respond to that and then we'll move into Q and A because um, I know a lot of people have a, probably a lot of questions and a lot of a lot of uh, ideas or thoughts. Yeah, um, I mean, so much to say here. I love everything Shakira said. The the work um, that both um, her organization and mine do are have have you know for the last many years now been about make it um, tangible that if you are interested in safety, security, public order, these are actually all pretty universal human values that, that people do want to accomplish. If you do want, if you're serious about that, we need to do things radically differently. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the values frame that I think this mass movement has, um, you know, stepped into um, lifting up and articulating. And um, it's really good timing because here's the thing, like there was nowhere to get the, the money to do the work that needs um, to be done except policing. Anyway, the, the, um, the disaster that is state and local funding um, because of the economic downturn and COVID like this was already coming for us. And I think that there, there is the widest possible base of support for a radical shift in investment. Even setting aside like the politics of policing, there's just um, a reality that 
we, we have to make a fundamental choice. We are either going to decimate systems of care that are already grossly inadequate um, in order to continue you know, betting on the police department as the strategy for safety and order, or we're gonna do something different. And um, really, this is the only road. I just think that folks have suddenly arrived at that realization all, all together and all at the same time. Um, but I do wanna name some challenges. So it is actually not like the easy part painful for some people, but the easy part is to say that we need to make a radical change. It is harder than it sounds to build what comes next. And I just want to name like, you know, policing has been an institution through which oppression and, um, you know, the, the lines of race and class have been um, reiterated for, for generations. That's absolutely right. But um, those lines are deeper than policing. And if you just take the institution of policing away, the fundamental American impulse toward um, radical inequity, like it still remains. And the way in which we provide care, these are other ways, like if you think about schools, if you think about access to healthcare, if you think about the way in which uh, many people's trauma is pathologized as behavior issues, whereas other people's trauma is thought is understood to be a health problem. Yes. That stuff's all still there. And so what we build next, right, it is um, critical that that be done with care and well, and, and that it be understood to be a system, you know, sort of, um, we will take care of our own people is um, good when it happens, but there are people who nobody is coming for, and those tend to be people who, as a public defender, I represented, and um, the people who are living unsheltered, struggling with drug use, who have been pushed out of um, existing social networks, um, their own families, like they're kind of at the end of the tough love continuum. <laughs> um, people aren't necessarily coming for those folks, and we do need a public system of care that takes responsibility for um, a meaningful response, not only for the needs of those, those human beings, um, but also that meaningfully responds to the problems that the um, conditions they're struggling with do pose for the wider public and the community. Those are all completely reasonable expectations. Um, so oversimplifying what we need instead will also not serve people well. It's just another way to victimize the same people mm -hmm. and, to, and ultimately to cook up a mighty backlash that we need not to, like we need to deliver on this, this new paradigm of safety. And so many of us are, you know, we know that can be done and that's really the work. Um, that's the next step. Yeah. Thank you. I think, um... I'm sorry. Oh, can I say one last thing? Yeah, one last thing. Absolutely. I know that people are anxious around or, you know, wondering about defund police versus the um, approach that's being taken in Minneapolis. I've, I've come to believe that actually the approach that's being taken in Minneapolis is not necessarily like more radical than defund. I think the idea of like take 50% of the funding away from an institution that you're going to leave in place like that's a really good way of having a terrible system. <laughs> you know, now you have an institution that lacks a clear mission, is probably underfunded to do the things it thinks it's supposed to be doing, um, is uh, angry and dangerous. And um, but we haven't truly thought about what it means to secure public safety as a system. Mm -hmm. um, from the ground up. In a way, what the conversation that Minneapolis is, you know, that the city council is stating that they're embarking on is potentially one that has, I think, a greater potential for forming common ground. Because you're saying like, well, what are, what are we supposed to be accomplishing mm -hmm. what it, for everyone? And what is the right way to accomplish that? And I think that that holds more promise, honestly, for delivering um, an approach that's going to satisfy um, the the wide majority of people in this country. I think Newark is approaching that in a in a good way. Um, Newark was, I think, 
Lisa, I think Newark came first, right? In terms of their consent decree. Um, so Newark, Seattle, New Orleans is in there somewhere, I can't remember, and then Cleveland. Um, but Newark was coming up upon, you know, enacting a new consent decree, but they also got a new mayor, a new mayor and a new police chief. So again, it goes, you know, for me, it's just like the reiterating the political will and whether how serious leadership is about enacting some, some real transformative changes that requires time um, and shifting of, of funds in such a way that everyone feels um, invested in. Thank you. Um, thank you for, thank you both for that. I mean, we really have to reimagine and rethink the way uh, of policing and police reform as the paradigm of providing safety and security for members, for ourselves and members of our community. Um, and so I wanna use that as a springboard to open it up to, um, to questions um, or thoughts or responses. Claudine, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. And this is a good uh, transition because we've had two questions about New Jersey, uh, specifically what Camden has done in reimagining its police department. Yeah, so the question is about Camden and Newark's. Um, is that right, Claudine? That's right. Yeah. Um, Shakira or Lisa, would you care to take um, one of you take that question? I couldn't speak to Camden. Lisa, could you? Because I could probably speak a little bit more to Newark. Um, yeah, I mean, I can just say, and I'm not an expert and haven't spent a lot of time immersed. I do know um, as a police department, Camden is often um, the counterpoint to, you know, like, is it possible to um, make enormous progress with policing? I think the answer is yes. I mean, I've definitely seen that. Um, uh, I think that is a different question than, is that the best way to, do, in a, in a um, world of resource scarcity, is that the best way to deliver community-wide um, stability and safety in our, like is the, um, are, there, are there critical pieces of that mission that are just per se outside the scope of a police department? And it's mm -hmm. just not the right question. Like mm -hmm. how do we build the best police department? Is that even the right question? And um, if that is the question that we're answering, I think there's lots of reasons to think that Camden is a great place to look, including just, uh, um, in national legislation and in like the California initiative and a lot of places people talk about where deadly force is necessary. It should only be used where it's necessary. Well, Camden is continuously like pushing the envelope to demonstrate that a lot of things that in other places it would have been thought to be necessary, it isn't necessary. I, don't, I really reject that entire framework and I think it's actually uh, uh, problematic. So, but let's just say that that's you know um, possible. It's being demonstrated. Still, is that the right conversation? I think we have to take this chance to imagine that that isn't even the right question. Shakira, did you have something to add in terms of the Newark experience? Yeah. So the Newark Community Street Team is exploring this very idea of. Is the police the right entity to contact for everything? Um, I saw an interview with a police chief, you know, indicating like, you know, this country keeps putting more and more and more on police to be responsive to um, things that they're not qualified to do. Again, I'm leaving out, you know, what is the what is the point of of police here? But really you know, should police be responding to a mental health crisis? Is that appropriate? Is there another number of families can call? There is no other number families can call. So, you know, is there a number that you can call, that families can call when their family member is in the midst of an addiction crisis? There is no other number to call, right? The number to call is always 911 and we get what we get. So it, the Newark community um, street team is, is exploring those alternatives with people who are trusted community leaders 
um, to, to just be responsive in ways where um, there's an understanding that the police may not be the appropriate first responder. If I could take that a little bit further with the question, um, what about um, reforms as it regards uh, the, the, the level of responsiveness a, a, the police should be charged to give to say a, an allegation of using a counterfeit $20 bill? Do you need police looking like that with equipped like that showing up in spaces like that? Let me raise something else, you know, that, that one, the answer, the answer is no. But two, you know, when we speak about victims of crime, people who live in communities um, where when they are a victim of crime, they are treated like a suspect, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where sexual assaults are not investigated, where the murder clearance rate is low, but departments are getting a lot of federal dollars for a number of, uh, number of different initiatives. Mm -hmm. So again, it, it's, about, it's about this relationship um, being indifferent to the violence that, um, that communities experience. Mm -hmm. um, we can move on to any other um, thoughts or comments or questions, um, Claudine? Sure. Uh, our next question is, do law enforcement agencies have protection for whistleblowers that are outside of the union that can be a conflict of interest? I fear that police of color fear speaking up as they would not get protection from their unions. I think the, the concept of, um, oops, sorry, the concept of um, whistleblower protection is, um, a bit of a mismatch with the union dynamic that I, I would never have expected this, but I've ended up spending a ton of time over the last 10 years um, through my work with uh, both the Community Police Commission, but also the LEAD program in Seattle um, with people within law enforcement who I have just profound respect for um, and understanding the informal um, sanctions that they are subjected to the cost. Let me just like use a um, very simple word. The cost that people pay for um, stepping out of the um, dominant self-interest narrative um, and having like that long-term vision of, you know, I think we're actually better off if we embrace a wide, sort of wider community interest and um, we should unite with the wider community and we should um, uh, decenter what are the traditional goals of police unions. Those people, it's not so much like whistleblower protection would mean that they couldn't experience like job discrimination. And yes, that, that does, um, uh, we had a lawsuit in Seattle um, vindicating people's um, ability to raise complaints and um, not suffer job retaliation. And people still won't do it because there's just so much to lose in informal ways. In um, uh, And I don't mean nobody will do it. Some people will do it. Um, and, and we don't, we lack the means to... Um, we lack the means to protect them against the most meaningful ways in which those sanctions are brought to bear, which include just social ostracization or ostracizing um, people. This is their entire world. They've grown up, they've known they were gonna be a cop since they were 16. Everybody they went to high school with is a cop. They like, it's amazing what people have to lose when they step away from that. And then there's also just the pure physical and people are not in, it's not metaphorical when they speak of, um, you know, what will happen when they're going, they call it going through the door, right? Like if you're going through the door, are you going to be left to without backup, without anybody, um, who is going to have your back, um, and essentially be left, to perish because um, you stepped away from the the, the assumed self-interest of 
your peers. I just don't think we as um, community or civilian partners have what it takes to genuinely protect those people. And I've just like, I've been one of the people who didn't have what it takes to protect our allies within the department. I just don't see that there's any legal protection that can really um, be sufficient. Thank you. Um, want to move on to the next question and left, um, Shakira had something to add? No. Okay. Any other? Uh, Body. Yeah, so our next question is how can we push to change the rioting narrative that is so often used in the media? And how do we reframe the system to put the people's outrage at racial injustice and lack of police accountability instead of constantly putting the welfare of property and capital first? Kira. I think we have to, we have to talk about what is violence in this country. And what, what the real values are and having some, some real like tough, honest conversations about that. People get really upset about um, how people who have witnessed their children die respond. How people who are in trauma respond. Um, but yet there, there hasn't been a real way of preventing that trauma from happening. There hasn't been a, a way of supporting people when they go through that trauma. So, I mean, you know, I'm hopeful about all the conversations that are happening um, and, and the questions that are being asked. I think we just have to keep asking questions and we have to have those tough conversations not just walk away from them. You know, I mean, for, I didn't watch the video. I just, I can't watch those after, you know, when you have spent um, a lot of time trying to, you know, suppress your own humanity and watching the, uh, the video of a child being killed over and over and over. And you realize that you should not do that because that's not healthy. You know, I've made a decision not to watch any, but I can understand as a parent how hard um, that moment was for people to see that man for such a period of time dying in front of them. But we're seeing, we're seeing a lot, you know, the show cops was canceled. There's, you know, there's investments going into racial justice programming, racial justice books are selling out of bookstores. We've never seen that before. We, you know, we're seeing like you know, kids my daughter's age who are like challenging their parents on their racial beliefs. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity, you know, in this moment, but it requires everyone to ask those questions. What do we value more? Is it, do we value bricks or do we value people? And when we value people, which people do we really value? Lisa, would you like to uh, add your thoughts or comments to that question? I just, I've been, it's a great question. Um, I've been really heartened to see how much um, folks out in the, um, you know, in the streets are sort of sorting that out for themselves. And they're saying, they're, the message is complex, right? They're saying, on the one hand, if everyone out here were breaking windows, that would be legitimate. Also, we're not though. <laughs> like, I mean, right. And I think that like by demonstrating the discipline of not taking, by and large, not taking steps that would be morally sort of warranted, but we're still choosing not to, but asking that that not even be the conversation. People are basically um, uh, charting a, a road for this conversation that most people can follow. Most people I think can, um, get there, like respect that that discipline is being displayed um, internally in the organic evolution of this movement. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also important for people to be laying out that like, if it, if it were not, that that would also be a legit, it's really the question is like, why aren't, more, why aren't more, why isn't there a more violent, um, uh, you know, set of behaviors that's targeted toward direct reappropriation or, you know, I mean, that's, those are, that's a good conversation to have. The fact is too, that's not really what's happening. And I think 
the more those dual points are made, the more respect the folks in the street gain with people who had that, you know, anxiety at, at the start. So, um, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, we're, we're, um, we're running close to the end of the time, but I'd like to ask one more question, have one more question if one is available before I close. Um, are there, is there one, any one question left on Claudine that um, we can pose or can I close now? Yes, um, if, there, if you wanna take one more, um, yeah. we have a couple different questions about what actions people can take as a community, in, including a question from our, our YouTube viewers about whether or not there's training that community members can go through to be, uh, to understand the issues better. The Wire, the show, watch that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Anna, Lisa, do you have any recommendations? Oh, I, I really, when we, st I, I agree when also if for those who have watched The Wire, you'll laugh to know that when we started Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion, which incidentally we're, we're working on a new name for that, um, but uh, when we started it, I had the police captain who was co-designing it with us. I gave him a full set of The Wire, but I told him not to watch it until we were done because the guy who plays his role in that show gets canned. And <laughs> I wanted him to not think that his fate was sealed if he would de facto decriminalize drug related crime. Anyway, um, I think, uh, you know, I have a lot of confidence in each community that is engaged in these conversations. There are experts. There are people who are just so good at um, sketching out like what we could do instead and what works. Um, and I, I just highly recommend, you know, decentering the conversation from police and recentering the conversation on what we could do instead. Um, I have admired greatly. I have been shocked here in Seattle, there's a call of business leaders that I attend weekly. And I got on it after the first week of protests and I expected to hear, um, you know, fear and anxiety about the broken windows and so on. That's not what they said. They said, we understand why this is happening. We are open to a new way of securing our needs for safety and order. And we want to um, make clear that we could support a very different paradigm. And gosh, you know, the more you can get there, um, create you. We all have to create um, a supermajority constituency that tells elected officials that they will get elected and reelected if they build that system. They will not if they don't. And we will be there for them as the sort of. Um, you know, nuances get hammered out. I mean, it's going to take a minute. So building that political base of support is the thing and find allies and tell one another you're going to, um, you're going to form that up. Uh, that's, that's critical. And can each of you give um, one or two examples of organizations that audience members can look to or look up to, to participate in, in such work? Some examples. Of course, your, 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 your organization, Shakira, I would imagine, um, would be open to bringing in people to support and advance the dialogues and your mission. Um, so thinking about things like that, could you identify two or three in your, your respective communities for people in the audience right now? Yeah, so just to give people a little background on our organization, it's a national multi-state organization with two constituencies, we work with underserved victims of crime as well as people with crime um, with prior convictions. And in doing so, we worked, and that's also representative of our staff. We uh, most of our staff falls in one or, or both categories. Often, people look at people who've been victims of crime and people who have convictions as these two polar opposites. When in actuality, there's a lot of overlap there. Um, and a lot of times people move from one group to the other because of the lack of support, you know, failing to be responsive around the victimization of, of people leads to um, a number of things, including, uh, you know, drug use, um, disruption of employment, uh, 
contact with the justice system. So all of that is, there's a, there's a lot of relationship here. And I think a lot of times we get away from the fact that whatever happens to me will eventually impact you, right? We're all interrelated. Um, so we have chapters all around the country where we are working with constituents to identify gaps in safety, identify gaps in responsiveness and develop policies with the membership of people that have been on the receiving end of violence, whether that is through um, use of force or whether that's through indifference. Um, so, you know, we have chapters all around the country um, and in many states doing so. Um, there are a number of, you know, I would suggest that folks look into a number of different restorative justice organizations. Um, there are, um, uh, there are a lot of reentry organizations that are engaging in policy work as well um, that I would also encourage people to, to look into. So locally, um, the, for people really focused on policing who didn't take my advice to stop thinking about that as the frame, um, the Seattle Community Police Commission has been reinvigorated in their um, meetings every couple of weeks and the um, additional forums that they're um, sponsoring, I think will be a very rich place to tune in um, because we're all still sort of remote. Um, it's easy to participate, easy to sit in on those meetings. So just Google Seattle Community Police Commission and go from there. In terms of like the build of um, what comes next, what are the alternatives? Um, like Shakira said, so our organization, um, the Public Defender Association, which we don't do public defense and we need a new name. Um, not only do we project manage um, LEAD, which is meant to be uh, what we do instead of booking people into jail and prosecuting people for um, low level problematic behavior that has to do with behavioral health needs and extreme poverty. Um, we have a restorative justice project called Collective Justice that is working on alternative responses to um, violence, interpersonal violence, and um, alternative models of accountability. Um, and then the Civil Survival Project, which is um, led by formerly incarcerated people um, working on removing barriers to reentry. Um, and then on the broader community level, there's um, the COVID-19 Mutual Aid Network has done remarkable work um, helping people to imagine um, what can happen instead and how they can, lots of different um, sort of sub um, networks there to um, connect up with. And then finally, for people who themselves are directly impacted and exposed to enforcement, um, are drug users, um, are, you know, sort of accustomed to being adversely affected by policing, um, Vocal Washington, which is an organization that we sort of um, are um, uh, hosting for the time being, is um, is relaunching. So all of those are great opportunities, but that they all ultimately feed back into the same conversation. So there's lots of different access points. Well, thank you again. Um, um, I want to close now um, by thanking um, thanking you, Shakira. Thanking you, Lisa, not only for leading this conversation, but leading um, aspects of this very necessary movement and um, that is so important to continue, especially in this day and age, as we grapple with issues of race and policing and, 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 and safety. So I wanna thank you more, more than anything for doing the work and continuing the work. I also wanna thank um, um, Case Western Reserve University School of Law and Seattle University School of Law for co-sponsoring um, this program on education around the George Floyd killing and, um, and reform efforts. We're going to do a third and final session um, next week, same time, where we're gonna be focusing on First Amendment and section, Second Amendment rights and the way in which those constitutional protections intersect and sometimes intersect very disturbingly and with tragic outcomes um, in 
the wake of what we're seeing um, today in terms of the demonstrations. So I hope you all will join us for, for that conversation. I also want to um, let you know that on our Facebook page, we'll be putting together a reading list um, that people who are interested, not only in the work of reform, but once again, um, having those conversations around race and racism um, can be, um, these books and resources can be useful starts to continue that conversation. And I wanna close by recentering all of this on the issue of race and racism. Um, and I'm reminded of a saying in listening to Shakira and listening to Lisa talk about um, the systemic issues and challenges that face us um, is this notion, the very definition of systemic racism. And that being that if you took all of the bad actors out of this thing, out of this institution, you are still left with structures that have disproportionate impacts upon certain people in certain communities. And those are the things that we have to work at dismantling. And as Shakira and Lisa are saying, reimagining um, our whole system of how we care for our communities and how we care for ourselves and each other and what we demand of our leaders. And um, I'm gonna close by showing you a video of a uh, three minute video of Toni Morrison. Um, I thought um, did an important uh, and very critical and powerful framing of the work that needs to be done and continue around race and racism in our, our country. So I'm gonna close with this video and I hope that um, uh, it is something that is as powerful to you as it was for me. Can you all see Toni Morrison on the screen? If you can, please just nod for me. Yes. Okay. All right, let me see if I can start it. Can you hear it? Yes. Charlie, but let me add, tell you that's the wrong question. Okay, what's the right question? How do you feel? Not you, Charlie, Murray, but don't you understand that the people who do this thing, who practice racism, right. are bereft? There is something distorted about the psyche. It's a huge waste and it's a corruption and a distortion. It's like this is profound erosion that nobody examines for what it is. It feels crazy. It is crazy. And it leaves, it has just as much of a deleterious effect on white people and possibly equal as it does black people. I always knew that I had the moral high ground all my life. I always thought those people who said I couldn't come in the drugstore and I had to sit in a funny place, I couldn't go in the bar. I did. And I thought they knew that I knew that they were inferior to me, morally. I always thought that, and my parents always thought that. You said your father was racist because he always felt like he, he was always superior. Felt, that's right, he always felt superior, and that was a form, you know, of, of, defense, of defensive racism. But if, if the racist white person, I don't mean the person who is examining his consciousness and so on, doesn't understand that he or she is also a race, it's also constructed, it's also made, and it also has some kind of serviceability. But when you take it away, I take your race away. And there you are, all strung out. And all you've got is your little self. And what is that? What are you without racism? Are you impure? Are you still strong? Are you still smart? Do you still like yourself? I mean, these are the questions. It's part of it is, yes, the victim, how terrible it is for black people. I'm not a victim. I refuse to be one. And the victim is the other person who is morally inferior. And 
that's what that's a serious question of course if you have to hold that's a, he has a her own self-esteem definition if you can only be tall because somebody's on their knees then you have a serious problem in my feeling white people have a very very serious problem and they should start thinking about what they can do about it take me out of it then give white people some free advice <laughs> So there's work to do. There's work to continue to do. And I hope you join Good us all grammar and work. spelling are important. Thank you. But if you want to write <laughs> essays that inspire messages that forge brighter connections. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris Adamson. Of course, you just thank you very much. And this see you soon. It's grammatically <laughs> correct, but it's wordy and hard to read. 